Uh, I am Gabby Bloom, and it is a great uh, professional and personal pleasure uh, to host the Professor Danny Statman uh, from Haifa University for this uh, lecture and conversation. Um, when I first came across Danny in writing, not in person, uh, he was one of the very early, uh, earliest commentators on the controversy of targeted killings. Uh, before it became this kind of moving industry of scholarship and commentary. Uh, and some of you even know this. So Dan wrote this paper, which I think is one of the most uh, insightful papers in the discussion, by taking a position, uh, he talked about name killing, so the idea of uh, dealing with an individual rather than an anonymous agent of an enemy power and how that changed the, uh, or, or using that prism to gauge the morality of the practice of targeted killing. And I thought it was a brilliant piece, um, which I relied on in my subsequent work. Uh, I then met Danny at, at Oxford, right, on the, their Center for Ethics and Law of Armed Conflict. Um, we had wonderful exchanges uh, since then. Um, Danny is a professor of uh, philosophy, chairs the philosophy department in Haifa University. Uh, he's widely known as an expert in really two fields. One is uh, religion and social, uh, um, dealing with uh, the idea of Jewish philosophy and, and how to deal with uh, Israel's uh, state and religion in Israel, but also as an ethicist of war. He's written extensively about the ethics of war. He's now co-authoring a book uh, called War by Agreement, uh, thinking about a contractarian model, just war theory. Uh, he's running it with another uh, very prominent uh, Israeli ethicist by the name of Isaac Ben Baji. Um, and uh, in addition to being a philosopher and being sort of an armchair philosopher, he also works extensively with Israel Defense Forces, uh, thinking about their code of conduct, what are what is the ethical code for the IDF. Um, he also, this is sort of this, apart from his day job, uh, initiated and now is one of the leaders of a wonderful program uh, that is called Out of the Wells. Is that the from the wells? The wells yes, uh, that brings together Jewish and Arab educators to read together from. Uh, the uh, text, the religious text of the uh, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish traditions out of the belief that knowing, being more familiar with these texts and learning them together helps us more mutual respect, understanding, um, and uh, possibly peace uh, among these communities, between these communities, uh, and it's a wonderful initiative. Uh, Professor Statman will talk to us today about the uh, cryptic principle proportionality in war uh, that we all know exists but is very hard to define or apply. Uh, just a couple of sort of housekeeping notices. The lecture is being recorded, uh, both audio and video. Uh, please silence your phones and if you do need to uh, go out early for class, just please do so quietly. Uh, and with that, welcome to Professor Stepp. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. So this, this research um, grew out of a sense that those of you who were ever teachers must have shared. So you teach something, and uh, then you mention some notion. And you, you know very well that you don't really understand this notion. And you just dread the minute that some smart student will say, um, hey, professor. Well, nobody's a professor in this area. <laughs> hey, 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 Danny, what exactly do you mean by that? So I've been teaching the ethics of war for some time. And when I get to um, the use in battle principles, I talk about some of them. And when, when I get to professionality, I just pray to the good Lord <laughs> that nobody does me, what exactly do I mean by that? But then I thought, maybe I'm the exception. Maybe there are other smart people out there, and they do know what this means. I mean what it means in action, not only kind of saying these words. So that, that was kind of the motivating force be behind this um, study. So let me start with some basic things. Um, so we all know that um, there's the, these different levels about the morality of war. 
one deals with the very justification of war, the very launching of war, that's the ad bellum level. And the other level deals with the question of how to conduct the war, the in bellum. And usually accepted, some philosophers don't like this distinction, that these levels are, are, are separate, okay? So we can bracket questions regarding ad bellum and talk about in, in bellum questions. So the, the, there are kind of three basic principles. The one is that you should never or almost never target civilians intentionally. Forget about, forget about extreme cases where you know, the, the entire world is going to be wiped out by terrorists. Forget about that. So that's the, the first um, principle. The second is that you are allowed to bring about harm to civilians if it's a side effect of an attack on a legitimate military target, that's okay, even though you know that in advance. You know that in advance because you know that the enemy headquarters is located near a residential area. You, you, you know almost for sure that civilians are going to be harmed, that's okay. And the third principle is a, is a kind of a limitation of the second one, namely that this permission to bring about collateral harm to civilians is constrained by this idea of proportionality. So it's okay to bring about harm to civilians as a side effect of, attack, of an attack on a, a military target, provided that this harm to civilians is not excessive, or is not disproportionate, or let's be positive, is proportional. Okay, if it's proportional, that's okay. Now, this third idea, the idea of proportionality, is the most interesting kind of philosophically, legally. The, 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 the first principle isn't very interesting. I'm not, it's not that nobody kills civilians anymore, I mean, intentionally. But there's nothing to talk about this, I mean, theoretically. Um, almost everybody realizes this is wrong, morally wrong, legally wrong. Even those, often even those who, who commit these crimes somehow acknowledge that this is wrong and you know, try to find all, all kinds of excuse, excuses. So that's not interesting theoretically. So most of the, the debate is about the third principle. What exactly does it mean for an attack to be proportionate? Um, so to follow up what I said at the beginning, I thought to myself, OK, if anybody can answer this question and help us you know, put some content into it, it must be experts. If experts know what this means, then at least we could kind of be relaxed that there is some answer here. Not an exact answer, but there is a significant answer. If even experts can't provide this with an answer, then big problem. OK? So that was the idea. So we had to define experts for the purpose of this study. And we defined experts as uh, people who kind of make an academic living out of writing, researching, and teaching this stuff. If anybody knows, understands, kind of in a deep way, this issue, it should be law professors and moral philosophers who write and teach about the uh, normative aspects of war, right? So um, we just went to Google's, um, Google Scholar, and we, we made up a list of hundreds of, of such experts around the, around the globe, people who have published academic stuff on these issues. I mean, th these are the kind of people who are often invited at the end of armed conflict to sit on all kinds of investigation committees. There are interviews on, the, on TV. They are kind of the experts. If you want to know whether some attack somewhere in the world was proportional or not, you ask these guys. Okay. So this is one group of experts. Th then we thought that Actually, there's another kind of expertise that we should uh, bring here, and that's kind of a more practical expertise. And that's the expertise that uh, military officers bring with them. OK, so one might argue that these law professors, with all due respect, they have these nice offices and write these papers. They don't really understand what war is about. So we should consult people who actually have fought um, and did face these situations. Okay, so, um, so we have a, we, academic experts and um, what you might call military um, or practitioners experts. Okay, 
Um, now the question was, how, how, would, how could we know that the experts get it right? Or how could we know that they get it right more often than others? Than, than others? After all, the, the, there's no objective no measure to say that some expert who, who told us that this is the right proportion got it right. Okay. This is not because morality is necessarily subjective in a philosophical way. We can open that in discussion. It's just that even those who believe that the, in some important sense, moral judgments are um, objectively valid, there's no empirical way to show it. Okay, So we need some other way to show that um, what experts say is, is better in a sense. And we thought the way to do it is to talk about reliability. So that's the test. We, want to, we wanted to know, to see whether these expert, the, the judgments of these experts are more reliable than the judgments of others. OK, that's fine. How do we measure reliability? So we come with, with, with three, three criteria, three tests here. One is what we call, call sensitivity. So as I'll explain in a minute, in the, in the study we had two kinds of targets, a strategic target and a tactical target. Okay. If you understand anything, you're supposed to know that there is a difference between these two targets. Okay. So that, that the, more, the more important target, that is the strategic um, target, justifies higher collateral damage. So you should understand that. The second is what we call robustness. We mean robustness to um, biases. So the idea would be that the more susceptible these experts would be to all kinds of irrational factors, they are less reliable. Okay. I mean, if they are experts, they're supposed to be either not at all or very, very to, to a very low degree, susceptible to all kinds of biases. The third test, which is the, the, the one we mainly focused on, and I think that's where our, our main contribution is, is convergence. So the idea is something like, like that. Um, so assume there's some patient in, in the hospital, some, some liver problem, OK? And you bring in two, three um, doctors um, who specialize in, in liver, and they can't agree on the right treatment. OK. So you turn to another 50, 100, 200 doctors who specialize in liver, and there's still nothing even close to convergence on what's the right treatment. OK. So if that's the case, we'll, we will probably conclude that regarding this kind of problem, medical problem, at this point of time, the doctors just don't know. Okay, they know other things; they're fine with other things, but with this specific um, condition, med medical condition, they just don't know. Okay, so we we assume here that if experts can't reach even a reasonable consensus, even a reasonable convergence of views, they are probably. There's probably just no knowledge there. OK, so um, so with all this in mind, we came up with the following study. We, we um, came up with two vignettes. Here's one of them. I won't read it all out, but you, you can do it. You get the, the basic idea. There, it, there's a war going on between two countries. We don't identify the countries by name. It's country A and country B, which is very important. We assume it helps to remove some of the political bias of the subject. OK, so this is a, a, a regular war. People said that such wars don't exist anymore. Maybe. This is a regular war. It's been on for some, going on for some time. It's a war between armies. It's not some you know, one day operation against bin Laden or some, something like that. One side is the just one, clearly the just one. That one is the unjust one, just to remove that problem. And the just side, country A, has an opportunity now to attack the headquarters of, of, of country B. OK? So 
Um, unfortunately, like in most cases, the headquarters is located in the capital city of country B. There's going to be collateral damage. So we turn to our experts and say, and this is what we ask them. Um, keep on, this will get back to it later. OK, so first of all, do you consider the headquarters, as I said, we have another vignette about an airbase, a legitimate mil 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 target at all? And if they say yes, then they have these options. Um, either it's permitted on, only if there's no risk at all, other, otherwise don't attack, or at almost any risk. You know, it's a war, don't be a child, and so on. <coughs> or give us a number, that's option three. Or I can't give a reason to answer. OK, if we had time, I would give you a few minutes to think about this and think what your answer would be. I'm sure some of you have taken a class on international law. OK, so, so the experts got this um, vignette with the answers. Um, what percentage of, do you think ticked the last one? I can't give a reason answer of the experts. None? One? Five. Five percent, you mean? Five percent. Zero. Okay. More than 40, yeah. four zero, more than 40 percent of these experts Take that option that they can't give us an answer. Yeah. Now, by the way, we add it to, to, to three. Three asks them to give it as an actual number. We add it and, and said, look, we realize it's hard to say 17 or 25. OK, we, we understand that. But give us an idea, you know, whether it's 10, 100, 2,000. Give us an idea, OK? So 40% said they, they couldn't give a reason answer. By the way, at the end of the questionnaire, we, we, we added this question. We told them that often at the end of hostilities, there are investigation committees. And we asked them whether, whether they see themselves qualified to serve on such a committee. <laughs> How many said they could serve on such a committee? Not everyone. Not, not everyone, but 70%, OK? Only 40% said they could give an answer. Um, but 70% um, still thought they would qualify. It doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Because, because, because human right. psychology is very complex, you know. Not because it's good. Okay, we can talk about it. Yeah. Fine. Um, okay, what's, what's interesting um, for the purpose of, of, of our main study is, of course, those who did give an answer. I think it's also significant that so many couldn't give an answer. It is significant. Uh, but the main um, results concern those who, who did give an answer. And those who did give an answer, um, when you look at the answers, to say they lack convergence is an understatement. So <clears throat> just to give an idea, if, if you look at the, take the median of their answers, OK, and then 20% up and 25% below. That's 50%. And that's, that's a very conservative assessment right now. So the, 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 the difference between the upper 75% and the lower 25% is 450 casualties. 450. Now, of course, if, if, if you take a, a, a bigger um, population here, the difference would be even, even larger. So that means in a standard attack of a military target in a residential area, there's absolutely no convergence between, between, between these, these experts. Um, I think this explains their lack of confidence, the lack of confidence of many of them to give an answer. They, they kind of know or half know that they're just guessing. They know that they don't really have an answer. They know that they don't have some kind of algorithm or principle that they're applying here. Therefore, they prefer not to give an answer. Um, OK. So that was, that's really the main, the main finding. Um, but then we thought to ourselves, OK, maybe the group of experts we created was too inclusive. And that kind of distorts the picture. 
What do I mean? So the group of experts, as I said, included mainly law professors. I think something like 50%. And the, the rest of them were main, mainly moral philosophers. Some, I think, historians of war. So one might say, look, these philosophers, with all due respect, they're philosophers. They play with ideas. They have no idea. They don't no sense of the real world. While people who do law you know, have their hand, hands on, on reality. Uh, they need to make decisions, very complicated decisions. Um, so forget about philosophers. Let's narrow the group of experts just to the lawyers, or the law professors. OK, we did that. Doesn't make any difference. Um, then we thought, OK, let's talk about the, the military um, um, experts, the officers. There also we had a very, very large convergence, a bit better. So it converged a bit better than the academic experts, but still it, it wasn't of any use. So we thought to ourselves, OK, maybe we should remove from the group. Is there a difference in the numbers? Um, in the numbers? No, I'll give you the numbers in, in a second. Yeah, it's close. Um, so we thought, okay, maybe we should we should have not included officers who don't have combat experience, because you know they could, they could be high tech. They can be they can be you know um, doing all kinds of stuff in the army. That doesn't mean that the fact that they're officers doesn't mean they really understand the battlefield. Okay, so let's take them out. We took them out. Didn't make a difference. Okay, so um, we still have to we still have these results. So then the question is, okay, how to explain this incredible um, distribution of views? Um, so there must be individual differences between the subjects, okay? And this maybe one day we could go into it. What explains the fact that some individual um, picks a lower or a higher number of casualties? But also, there might be differences, kind of collective differences. Maybe the fact that some of the, our subjects belong to some group made a difference. Indeed, it did. Americans versus non Americans. So, maybe I didn't say that earlier, I should have said that earlier. So, um, I explained how we got to the academic experts regarding officers. We have a sample from the U.S. Naval Academy. A nice sample of how many are there? 234. And we have a nice sample from the Israeli Army. The Israeli Army is not only from the Navy, from, from all, all across the Army. Okay? So the, these are the, the only two samples we have from, from officers, from, from armies. Okay, so... When we compared, when we um, split the group of officers into Americans and Israeli, which is non-American for the purpose of this research, and we did the same with the experts, American experts versus non-American non experts, the difference is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, I'll show you the graph soon. So the, the Americans, both the experts and officers, are extremely more tolerant regarding um, civilian casualties of the other side. Um, now, this is kind of interesting. It's not part of our research. You know, it's just kind of a side effect, an interesting side effect. Um, that doesn't mean the Americans are wrong, by the way. As I said, I don't have an independent way to show who is right or wrong here. Uh, maybe Americans should be kind of concerned by this. Maybe not. I don't know. But that's just the result. Um, um, and I, it's not part of this um, study to speculate about the re reasons for that. I assume it has to do with the, this culture of Westerners and you know the, the bad guys should get what they deserve, and the the, um, the punishment system in the U.S. And maybe I mean, we can talk about that. Maybe, but um, th th these are the facts. Um, Okay, so let's just see some of these graphs. Um, okay.
Okay, so I should say something about this, though. I won't have time to talk too much about what we did here. So as I said, we, we, wanted, we wanted to test susceptibility to biases. So one group got the, the questions as you saw a few minutes ago, OK? The other group of experts got the same vignette, exactly the same vignette. But then we said to them that according to the, our intelligence, it's estimated the, that the, the attack would cause the death of 33 or 30 civilians. And then we asked them, can you see up there, whether yes means it's legitimate, the attack is legitimate. And if they said yes, we asked them, OK, if, it, if 30 is OK, how far, how up does it go? 40, 50, any cost? OK. Or they would say no, and then we would try to, to ask them no, because no risk is allowed, or maybe 10 would have been OK, OK. So what we're using here is the famous anchoring um, effect, OK? This, this embarrassing um, psychological bias we have that if, if we are not sure about the number of something and we see some number on the wall here, that, that affects the answer we give. Um, I think it's Kahneman who found yeah, right? Um, so we, we assume that when we give them a number, that will, that will bring them closer to the number. And then we had another group which was similar to the second group, which I just explained. But for them, we told them that the attack has already taken place. So it's retroactively. So we had this assumption that this, this could make, make a difference. If it's retroactively, do you think people would allow more or less casualties? More, OK. So we have the same intuition. Why? Maybe because when it's, when it's prospectively, it's as if you are killing them. You need to decide whether to kill them or not. If it's already been done, OK, it's different. That, that, that was the assumption. So that's one bias. So we had two biases, the, the effect, the, um, sorry, the, the anchoring um, and the temporal order. And we also, we played with the order of the vignettes. Some got the, the air base before the headquarters. Some got the headquarters before the the airbags. Um, OK. So um, no, by the way, <coughs> OK. So I don't have a pointer, but we'll manage. So look at the, we experts are good at something. What are we good at? We, 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 we teach and we know this is kind of basics that you, you are allowed to kill civilians if it's a side effect. And we also know that it's, it's not the case that any number goes. Okay? So if you look at the, the zero casualties, so experts and officers are very low there, um, while lay people are relatively high. And if you go to almost any number, so the lay people, that's the green bar, that's almost 40% of the lay people. These are Amer American lay people. OK, so almost 40% almost of the American lay, pe lay, lay people say, we're at war, whatever it takes. OK? Um, it's quite surprising that even the officers here, even the officers here, that can say 30%, go for this option, almost any. But again, remember, remember, remember that this group includes the Americans and the non-Americans, the Americans and the Israelis. If we t take up only the Americans, it's going to be higher, OK? Which is, again, a bit shocking, a bit shocking. Because it, if, it's something, if there's something you, you learn in your first ethics you know, class in the army, even before you're an officer, or the most if you're an officer, is that it's not the case that you, you can just you know, kill how many, you know, Civilians with no limitations. OK. Um, so the thing is, what this slide shows that we, we experts are good at understanding. We have, we have a theory, a kind of a theory. The theory is that you're allowed to kill civilians, but it must be proportionate. OK. Um, here's the convergence of the experts. So. 
look at the 25%, okay? Plus minus 25%, and, and you see the 450, okay? So that's, that's the, the, the difference between the upper 75% and the lower 25% for the academic experts. For the offices, it's 183. Um, the lay, peop lay people is very interesting, American lay people. So m many lay people has this sense that uh, you're not allowed to kill civilians at war. So maybe close to 40% said either you shouldn't risk civilians at all, or maybe you know something like one or two or three. But then after you you pass that threshold of the 40%, whew, almost no limitations. Okay. Um, now look at the American versus non-American experts. So again, look at the 25%. So the non-American non experts is 115. It's also a large convergence. Americans, 985 casualties. That, that's a difference there between the 25% and the 75%. Um, and these are the officers, um, the non-American, the, the Israeli officers, it's, it's mod, more than 10 times larger, okay, the, um, the lack of convergence. Okay, so... Um, as for biases, um, we, sh we saw that experts were affected by the order of vignettes, which of course is irrational, but they were affected by that. We saw that lay people were affected by temporal order, and officers were not significantly affect affected, should be, by any of the biases, um, which is kind of interesting. I don't know exactly how to explain this. Um, okay. And all this confirms Gabby Blumens. <laughs> I added this, mo this, this morning, okay? Um, now, um, how, to, how, how do we explain um, this difference between the groups? So there's the fact that with non-Americans, both experts and, uh, and offices, the convergence is much better. So maybe they, go, they get it right. You remember that was one of, one of our tests to show that somebody is doing well in this area. But that doesn't make sense to us. I mean, this, that's kind of arbitrary. Um, because after all, we're talking of people who study the same textbooks, are committed to the same principles, are often in touch in conferences and so on. So it doesn't seem... So it doesn't seem to be any good reason to think that the non-Americans got it right while the Americans, you know, were just, are just wrong. Um, and, and in general, the, a better convergence is a, is a necessary condition for being an expert. It's definitely not a sufficient condition to being an expert. So what does explain the larger um, convergence when one exists? So what we find, found was that there's an interesting correlation between the size of the median and convergence. Okay, what does it mean? The lower the median, the better the convergence. So with, um, for instance, the, the Israeli offices, the median was very low. There were very, very sensitive to um, causing, to killing, you know, um, enemy civilians. Therefore, since you're talking about, you know, very small numbers, the convergence was also relatively small. While the, with the Americans, the median was very high. As a result, the convergence was also, um, um, I mean, the lack of convergence was, was more serious. Okay, so... Um, that's our explanation. One can still ask why this is the case. Why is it the case that the, 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 the median and the mean, by the way, but the mean is less important here because there are outliers. So the, the median is a better um, notion to use here. Why is it the case that the non-American, the, the non-Americans, officers and professors 
their median is much lower than the Americans. I don't know. We can talk about it. We can speculate. These are the facts. Um, OK. So one thing we didn't check here, because it has been checked by others, but maybe in the future we should check it directly, is political biases. Um, so my partner, Ra'anan, has done a, a, a different um, a, a study about this in Israel. And, and he showed how uh, people's political uh, views affect their legal judgments about proportionality. Um, so they, they used some scenario of some attack in Gaza. You're attack, attacking some terrorists. There's going to be some collateral damage. Legally speaking, is this proportional or not? And, and they sent this to hundreds of lawyers in Israel. As you know, lawyers are supposed to be trained in this kind of thinking. And they, 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 um, before the answer to after, don't remember that, to fill in a, a questionnaire, including questions about their political views. And there was a clear difference between left, leftist and, and right-wing Israelis. Okay? Um, this is also confirmed by a study by um, Scott um, Sagan and Ben, ben Valentino, um, which is the summit by saying the following. The public, the, the American public, is much more willing to excuse soldiers for participation in unambiguous war crimes when the crimes are part of a war for a just, just cause than when the war's cause is unjust. Okay? So one's ad bellum views clearly contaminate one's in bellum views. Now, their study showed that even regarding clear war crimes, or the more so, I speculate, when it, when it would come to just proportionality judgments. So if you think that in general, so if you're, if you're a liberal American, and let's say you're against the war in, in, in Afghanistan, and you hear about some uh, American attack where two Af Afghan civ civilians were killed, your immediate reaction would be that that's disproportionate, OK? While if you happen to support the war, you probably will say that th this is proportional. OK. So let me turn to some points of discussion, and then I hope we have time for a bit of discussion. Um, so let's go back to the, just the analogy with, with the liver doctor. So one might say that with this <coughs> disagreement between the, the doctors, there's just no answer. And the same here. One might say, look. So many expert, experts give us so different answers. There's no, no, just no answer. Um, so philosophers talk about the problem of, of vagueness. So the, the standard example is a very painful one for me. Am I bold or not? No, don't answer. Don't answer. Some might say that there's no answer to this. There's no, there's no answer uh, clear. There's no true answer. There's no truth of the matter regarding whether I'm, I'm bold or not. It's just a matter of vagueness. Okay. I don't think our study justifies this conclusion, that there's no truth of the matter. So I, I think it, ju it does justify a more modest conclusion, which is that at this point of time, our epistemic capacities are not good enough to give us an answer. Maybe one day, who knows? Right now. We can't give an answer. Um, now, this is very important. Um, not to interpret this in, in a trivial manner. There's a, the trivial point that there are so many gray zones everywhere. Okay, so now it's clearly day. Twelve o'clock. Twelve, Twelve at night is clearly night. Four fifty-one today. Well, we can talk about it. This is a, that's not the conclusion to go home from our study. It's far more troubling. It's far more troubling. It's not that we have some area where we have a clear view and some gray zones. Um, OK, so um, one might argue that really our study doesn't justify this conclusion because there wasn't enough um, information in the vignette. And this is a response we got from many of, of our colleagues. They said, 
Well, how can we say if we justify it or not? Give us more information. What, what exactly is this, is this attack going to achieve? How many civilian lives on, on our side, on country A side, will be spared thanks to this attack? Will it lead to victory? To them I answer that you have forgotten this, this notion of the fog of war. The fog of war is, is real. It's real. In real, real um, wars, one never has an answer to these questions. There's a, a general assumption that when you attack the enemy, your enemy's headquarters, that's kind of a good idea. That's, that's good for the war. Even that, you can't be sure. You know, sometimes you kill the enemy's chief of staff, and then have a new chief of staff, which is worse for you. So even that, you're not sure. But have this general idea that this, this is good. How good? How many lives is, is, is this going to save on your side? Who can say that with any you know, kind of responsibility? Um, OK. Um, then somebody might say, look, I'm telling you, I've been doing this stuff a lot of time. I've, I've, writing, I've written all these books and articles, given all these talks around the world. I'm telling you, headquarters, 40, 40 civilians. Now, OK, I realize that all my colleagues from I look all directions and my colleagues come up with different numbers. But logically, that doesn't mean I'm wrong. They might all be wrong. I, I got it right. And the fact that all these people disagree with me, that by itself doesn't provide me with an answer to withdraw from my reason, judgment, based on, based on all these years of reading and writing and teaching this stuff. OK. So. Um, I think the way to, to answer this um, um, response is through the philosophical problem of peer disagreement. So the problem goes like this. Suppose there's some, some issue where myself and some other person disagree. The thing is that this other person and myself are equally smart equipped with the same, we all know the relevant knowledge. We were all trained in the relevant field, whatever that field is. So if I still think that I'm right and he's wrong or she's wrong, I need some argument to justify that. Why, why, what basis is it to think that my judgment is right, okay? Given that we are ep epistemic peers, okay? And many philosophers think that if that's the case, that we are epistemic peers, I should really withdraw my judgment until further arguments can be found. OK? I think our study provides a kind of an empirical way to see this problem on a large scale. When you talk about a sample of you know, 200, 300 people, all of them there's no reason to think that I'm smarter than, you know, than them. There's no reason to think that I, 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 I've, re I've read more. I might have read more than this one, but not more than that one. Okay? So on average, there's no reason to think that I'm kind of more qualified to give a better answer. And if that's the case, then I think this is a strong example of the, 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 the conclusion, like the, the one that those philosophers draw, which means that I should just abstain from any judgment at this point. And if I, I don't, this is a pathetic sign of my vanity. As if all the other experts who have read the same stuff, and you know, they were all trained at Harvard, and so on, and they think differently, and I think, no, no, they're wrong, and I'm right, it's just a, just a case of vanity. Um, OK, now, the, the epistemic requirement to abstain from, from judgment in these cases I think it's even stronger in moral judgments. Because when, when you impose blame on somebody, that in itself is, is, is kind, of, kind of a punishment, a kind of a sanction against the, the other the, the side. And you need a good reason to do that. If you're blaming me, ultimately you're blaming me for killing civilians 
with no justification. That's, that's the, the accusation. That's a serious accusation. Now, it's, you can make it if you have grounds, but you don't have serious grounds. So shut up until you have more information or better arguments. Um, it's also significant because um, if I take you seriously, that will impose constraints on my self-defense, and that, that's very serious. So it might be justified, but if you don't prove it's, just, it's justified, then don't impose that constraint upon me. OK. Um, so OK, so let's just conclude with another more minor troubling thought for us as means here moral, philo moral philosophers. Um, only we talked about the first one here. So it has already been shown that ethicists are neither, neither more nor less likely than other professors to act in, in accord with their expressed moral attitudes. Okay, that's a kind of a, a sad conclusion of, of an empirical research that showed that these moral philosophers who talk about justice and empathy, blah, 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 are no better than any, any others. Okay, but then one would have hoped that are at least good in providing reliable guidance to real world moral dilemmas. Okay, so you don't behave better, but at least you can give us some you know, real advice. But our study encourages serious skepticism about this hope. So what are we good at? Okay, I'll end at that. Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, I have a ton of comments, but I get the benefit of having coffee with Danny after this talk, so I'll leave the floor to you guys, anyone who wants to raise a question. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm sort of curious about how the U.S. and <coughs> non-American uh, individuals in the study express, you know, in terms of, like, the numbers, what they were comfortable with, and the part of me is wondering, like, does it have to do with the fact that they're not dealing with war on their homeland? I think the last time we dealt with it was what, the War of 1812, except for Pearl Harbor. And then, on the other hand, bigger countries more comfortable with big numbers, right? So they don't see the effects of, of you know, the collateral damage and the people being killed at all. They're not next door neighbors. And just everything super in the supersized big countries, just like whatever numbers. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if you, how you perceive that issue and, and how it plays into the analysis, maybe on the individual perception. Well, the thing is that even, even though the war is kind of a concept far from them, they, they are very tolerant after the first kind of 30, 40%. The rest of the American lay people are very tolerant to um, um, civilian casualties of, on, the, on the enemy side. So, um, so that's the fact. The, how to explain this fact, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think it has to do, and the, the other studies, study I mentioned by Sagan and Valentino show that the, that the American public in general is kind of very harsh. Um, I mean, we are the good guys and the bad guys, and the bad guys, you know, should, should suffer, and they start and it's their fault, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure about this. Um, and, and, and nothing in this study proves either no explanation here. Um, also, regarding the, the population that are um, less tolerant to um, civilian casualties, I'm not entirely sure what the explanation is. Um, so we take the Israeli case. Um, as an Israeli, I would like to think, and maybe it's true, um, that it's at least, at least partially motivated by a strong moral commitment. Um, I know, I mean, firsthand, I know that the army invests a lot um, talking about what's called in the army purity of the arms, the importance of, of use value distinction, and so on. So maybe that's what we're, that, that explanation, but not, not necessarily. Maybe it's just the fact that Israelis have a lot to, to lose on the international level if too many civilians are killed. And that's the real explanation here why the Americans don't give a damn. A superpower, they do whatever they want. So I don't know. Well, I'm going to just share a quick anecdote. I have no idea if it sheds any light. It may be very ambiguous light on our dilemma. I'm on the staff here, but I spent 37 years as an organizer for Amnesty International here in our community. 
Now, as you can imagine, many of these dilemmas confronted us, both on Israel and other countries. And when we would point to this attack, or Gaza, or Janin, or Grozny, and other places, uh, the response we'd get either from the governments, including the Israeli government, or their apologists here, more often their apologists, was, well, you don't know what proportionality is anyway. And how many would be okay for Israel or the Russians and the Americans to kill? And we're not going to give them an answer to that. It's our job to give an answer to that. It's not. Well, that's, that's the, the difficulty on our side and the challenge we would face is Amnesty International, let's say, supposed to say to the Israelis, okay, you do what you need to in Gaza, but only up to 50 casualties. If you, if you only kill 50, you won't hear from us. We can't be in a position to say that. Well, so it's what's not our job to decide how many civilians should be sacrificed for your safety. Although that is a decision the army and the political leadership has to make all the time, and that every government makes, whether you identify with that government or not. So my question is, where, where do you find some moral restraint? Who imposes moral restraint? And I'm not sure we have that, to me, is the real answer. And okay. I don't see where there is moral restraint. Okay, first of all, I'm kind of unclear about this. I mean, you said you would come to, let's say, Russia, and you would say, look, this, this account shouldn't have done that, right? Well, right, of course. Sure. And then they would say, ah, sure, Mr. Mr. Amnesty. So, <laughs> please tell us what should have been done. And you, you say, no, you say, I, I, can't say, I can't tell you what you should have done. <laughs> That's exactly the dilemma. That's exa We're not going to go and say, we have the military expertise to say, you use that weapon, not this weapon. You, well, we would do our best in difficult circumstances to defend the principle, which is you limit civilian casualties to the best you can. If we see a pattern that shows callousness towards civilian casualties, and that's easy to do, unfortunately. I don't think it's, a, it's, a, it's that easy. That, that's exactly what we showed. It's not easy at all. Well, it's, it's, easy only, it's easy only at the extremes, and the extremes are quite rare. I think none of the cases that you... Oh, I'm not sure. Most of the cases you dealt with were not at the, at the extreme at all. We're not talking about you know thousands or hundreds of, of, of casualties, and when it comes to sm smaller numbers, it's not clear at all. So I'm really not sure what the basis was for your criticism. Well, this is the dilemma I'm sharing with you. Okay, fine. Now, if you're asking, okay, so everything is for grabs. That's what I'm saying. I mean, if we give up the proportionality constraint, everything is for grabs. So that's a good question. So here, are two things or three. I don't know. One is there's still the extreme cases. Okay, so extreme cases are, are still, there, there is a convergence among, among, among experts or a, a much better convergence regarding the extreme cases. Okay, so that's one answer. The second is that there's still the necessity test. Okay, if you could have achieved the same military um, result without um, this collateral harm, you should have done that. And thirdly, of course, there's the, the basic prohibition against international uh, in, intentional attack of civilians so these are this kind of these other principles kind of balance our argument for the impracticability of the proportionality test that doesn't really work and now we can understand i mean if i'm right in all this why all these governments were, were a bit impatient with you because even without reading our, our study there was sensing that something unfair was going on you don't have a clear criterion and still, you criticize us for behaving wrongly. So they, they felt, I guess, that something wrong was going on. Maybe. Yeah, thank you so much. It was really, really interesting. Um, I, I just had a couple of comments while we were presenting on the modalities of, of the study. Uh, not comments, but questions. Um, the first one is, um, so basically, respondents were asked about whether this, they thought it was acceptable or how many civil casualties would be acceptable, right? But I'm wondering whether they were aware that they should respond as a matter of law or not. Um, the reason I'm saying this is that I'm wondering the extent to which military experts would tend to answer you know, low, low level of civil ca casualties, not as a matter of law, but as a matter of strategic cost. A lot of military experts have um, internalized the fact that it costs strategically to kill citizens today, and so I'm wondering whether you took that into account or not. No, I think it was clear that we're um, talking about the, the legitimacy of the um, 
right, but, but so that can be yeah. a, as a matter of law or, or yeah. other rights. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, we, we, left it, we, we left it on purpose on because whether it's a legal question or a moral question, it's definitely a normative question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the, the other thing, yeah, you mentioned that it would be good in the future to know about political bias, but I was thinking also, um, I was thinking about the temporal uh, aspect of it and, and when exactly, exactly you ask this question, because I was thinking about a context that I know a bit better, which is friends. And I wouldn't be surprised that French public opinion and lay people would be more tolerant today towards civilian casualties now that we're fighting ISIS and that we feel the threats in Homeland that we were, I don't know, 10 years ago. So I was also thinking, I'm sure the battles that their country are fighting now also has an impact on their moral acceptance of civil casualties. Yeah, I entirely agree. So it should be kind of a long um, study you know, checking it every five, ten years and seeing the differences. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Although yeah. the Israeli American context is almost the opposite, right? Because one of the surprising things about it is precisely that Israelis experience the war in a much more personal and immediate way than yeah. Americans. And you would think that that would cause them to be more tolerant to right. the casual right. It's a much more intercollective mm -hmm. conflict of right. us versus them in a way that Americans don't perceive Afghans or yeah. Iraqis. And so that's another... Yeah. Do you see it? Yeah. It's sort of the counterpoint yeah. to yours, which I yeah. may very well, it will be my hypothesis too, but it's sort of interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And cool. maybe in relation to that, yeah, the, the result about the Israeli uh, military being very um, wary of civilian casualties was quite surprising. Mm -hmm. but, but I was wondering also whether it would change, because the question was about killing civilians, but I, I wonder whether th there would be a difference if we asked if it was okay to destroy civilian objects, for yes. example, mm -hmm. and the ex or maybe depending on armed forces, it would change. Would the Israeli military be more tolerant towards destroying civilian objects, even though the impacts for the civilians are, you know, as detrimental? Yeah, you're right. We, 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 we uh, explicitly, as I saw in, in question one, we, br we bracketed other, <laughs> other harm, mainly because, mainly because it's just hard to measure that. Yeah, I mean, we could ask, you know, a lot of harm that that wouldn't give us. We talk about numbers of people, you know, dead people, it's clear. Um, now, we, we, we plan very soon to um, run the, the, the study with the Israeli lay people. It's going to be interesting to see. And then hopefully we can, uh, we have, we'll, have, um, we'll be able to compare American lay people and, and American officers, Israeli lay people, Israeli officers, and, and see. I mean, my hypothesis is, that um, in contrast to most, most people think, the army is more um, restrained than, than the public, okay? I think in, in Israel this is definitely the case. Here I'm not entirely sure, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, here, I th so here it's also the matter of who goes to the, into the army, okay? So it might be the case that those who enlist the army, volunteer to the army, already have some kind of political, moral views um, which make them even, you know, make them harsher than the, the general public. Remember also that in Israel, you don't have a clear distinction between the law philosophers and the officers. So many of the experts you're interviewing have had military training and practice in Israel, yeah. which in the United States is not the case. So we have much greater convergence between these groups right. Right. that you can't keep them separate. Uh, yes. Um, uh, I was interested in the group of people who said that they couldn't give a reasoned answer. You said at the end that um, some of your subjects wanted to know more specific facts, like yeah. what would be the benefit of the um, action. And it occurred to me as I was thinking about how I might answer this, that I would also want to know precisely those kinds of things, even if there was a, you know error bars on them, like what do you expect or what are your aims to achieve through this? Um, my, I, I have a guess about some of the difference that you found between the Americans and the Israelis, that they might be substituting some assumptions about the benefits of war, um, similar to what um, somebody, oh, I think you left. Um, somebody here suggested a moment ago, uh, that there's a difference in the population size. Perhaps the Americans are saying, in absence of any other information uh, about who, what the, what the degree of benefit to uh, country A might be, I'll substitute um, the population of country B, which I, country A, which I don't know, but I'll just say it's about like my country. 
So if country A is about the size of my country, then the beneficiaries are, say, the whole population, or 10% of the population, or something like that. And then what's proportional to that is going to be a higher number than somebody coming from a smaller country. But getting away from that specific hypothesis, it may be that when you don't give people this information, they have no choice but to make some guesses, and their guesses are driven by just random, you know, what number is written on the wall of the room that they just walked into. And if you supply them with um, some uh, estimate that's, that resembles the information that a uh, decision maker actually has in war, you might reduce some of the um, wild lack of convergence things. Yeah. So one thing we're planning to do, maybe in this area and also in other areas, to take the same vignette and kind of expand it to three pages of details which say the same in the bottom line. Okay, that does make, really make a difference. And see whether, whether, whether people answer differently. Um, so the same, we, we, you can present a, a dilemma in, let's say this, this, this patient in hospital who refuses to get treatment. And doctors think that it's essential to give treatment, otherwise the, the, the patient is gonna die within two days. Okay, that was kind of three sentences, right? Then I, I could ask people what they think about this situation, or I could add all kinds of information in the blood test and stuff, but it, it boils down to the same thing. Um, and apropos these uh, um, dilemmas about treating patients, this study, I'm, I'm, I'm the last slide about what we are good at, um, has led me to th some troubling thoughts about the, 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 the fact, which I think is the fact here too, that it is common to think that we more philosophers have this, this expertise in um, making concrete ethical decisions. That's why we are invited to serve on you know, ethics committees of hospitals and, and so on. I, I myself are on such a committee of Haemic Hospital and I'm sitting there because I'm a moral philosopher, okay? So this is this idea and all kinds of um, um, health, uh, bioethics, uh, committees and commissions and so on. But all this study made me think that... this just resign. <laughs> that this, I mean, I, I now think that this is just crazy, really. I mean, why should the fact that I can write these fancy academic articles with ni nice footnotes and so on, how, how could this prepare me to make a real-world decision in, in a case like the one I just mentioned, which is the kind of cases we, we, we discuss in our uh, committee, this particular patient with this particular illness and this particular family, family with their own interests, how, how should, <laughs> what exactly prepared me to say anything more intelligent, more helpful than anybody else? On that positive note, <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking Professor Sam.